welcome to Monticello Presbyterian Church. If you're here this morning, it means you remember to turn your clocks back last night. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, there's a several announcements on the back of your bulletin. I'm just going to highlight uh, two or three. We have a community prayer service uh, this evening at 4 p.m. at Rose Bowl Field. Uh, if you haven't yet sent Ad Advent devotionals in, please get them to uh, Linda Aldridge or the church office. And then there are several things coming up on the calendar. Exciting things. Community Thanksgiving service will be here at Monticello Press on Sunday, November 22nd. Rise Against Hunger will be scheduled for December 20th. And the Christmas Cantata will be held at Monticello Baptist on December 6th, and we're all looking forward to the cantata. Gail has something. Uh, you want to come up or just uh, from there? Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank John for asking me to do the moment for mission this morning. What I'm about to tell you may seem a little unorthodox as a mission moment, but here we go. Um, some of you may have read in the paper about the city of Monticello's efforts to clean up the litter that is plaguing our beautiful city. The initiative is called Beautify Monticello, and it kicked off on October the 25th with Jasper County Charter School and Jasper County Fire Explorers. Piedmont Academy did their cleanup on Friday and will be joined by four other churches in November. I have met with Session and have been given the green light to involve Monticello Presbyterian to join the cleanup campaign, which will be ongoing monthly, beginning on Saturday, November the 14th. We are adopting Short Street behind the church, down to Church Street, and up to Washington Street. They are some of the most troublesome areas in our city. John and I are the first volunteers. We hope that some of you will join us at 9 a.m. Here, here at the church in the lower parking lot on November the 14th. The city is supplying the trash bags, the gloves, and the vests. The street department will pick up the trash bags the following Monday. Please give, please give this uh, prayerful consideration and help us rid Monticello of litter. And I'm asking for a little bit of leeway here. Can I have a little bit of leeway? Okay. You give Gail an inch, and, and you know, I mean, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, Downtown Development um, Authority is very pleased to announce that at 139 West Washington Street, we will open the shops of Monticello this has been um, a project that was the brainchild of Wendell Yoder. If any of you know Wendell, they own Yoder Outdoors and the Trez Group. When you walk into the shops in Monticello, you will see shops that look like historic buildings on the left side, like Harvey's Hardware, uh, Eddie Ray's Barbershop, uh, the old gas station. On the right-hand side will be historic homes of Monticello. David Dyer's cottage that he uses as part of it, Laura Curry's house is in it, um, Mimi's house, my house, but it's all new retail in the front. The back is vintage and the, behind that is antique furniture. This is a tremendous use of 4,000 square feet of space and we hope you will all come out on November the 7th at 10 o'clock for our grand opening. Thank you very much. Joseph, did you have a question? Are we going to, I'm sorry, I can't, are we going to have recycling? Um, all we're gonna do is clean up the litter, it'll go in the trash bags and it will go to the landfill. Um, the city has not, restarted the recycling program. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. We'll be there for the cleanup, right? <laughs> Please join me in our call to worship.
We remember, O oh God, the countless saints of history who have blazed the trail of courage through time. We remember, O oh God, the tender touch of loved ones, the example of heroes, the healing words of comforters, the remarkable acts of fearless ones. We remember, O oh God, We remember, O oh God, the supreme love of Jesus, the blessing of his spirit, the reminder of his words, the sharing of his suffering, the glory of his resurrection, shown forth in the lives of his disciples, young and old, dead and living, articulate and silent, strange and familiar, We remember in every time and place the saints of God who have, who has, have shown us the Lord. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us worship God with joy. Our lives are full of mistakes and errors, times when we follow idols of our own making instead of the one true God. We are not alone in these mistakes. All of those who have come before us also were plagued with temptation and sin. Let us come before God, just as generations of believers have done before us, and pray for God's forgiveness and grace. If you would join in the unison prayer of confession. Beloved God, you have made yourself known to all the saints who have gone before us through the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. Like those who have gone before us, we know that we do not always love you as you have We do not always do as you would have us do. In our stubbornness, we turn from you when we should turn towards you. Hold us close to your heart to comfort us when we should know friends and family and help us to know that they are rejoicing in your presence. We praise you for the grace you shower on us, constantly forgiving our errors, especially the ones that we don't share with you. Hear now the silent fears and worries of our hearts. Friends, hear the good news. Though countless numbers of our ancestors did not follow God's ways perfectly. We have hope of God's loving mercy because of the one who did. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, God has already forgiven us. In the name of Jesus, we are set apart and made holy. We are rightly known as saints. Thanks be to God for God's mercy, grace, and love. Amen. I just made Amanda very happy. I turned on my microphone. Um, as, as you can tell, we're, we're sort of uh, focused pretty closely on the understanding of today as, as All Saints Day. Um, and it occurred to me as, as Gail was doing her moment for mission that in truth, beautify Monticello in caring for the environment in which we find ourselves living is in fact an exercise of stewardship. So, just wanted to mention that in the context of all of us saints who are gathered together because we're going to talk about stewardship as well today. Um, I, are, are you guys going to ring bells where you sit? Good. Okay. Just making sure that I was on the same page with y'all. If you would, please turn to the insert that you'll find in your, your bulletin on the, the side that's labeled All Saints Day, November 1, 2020. in joyful expectation of the resurrection to life eternal 
we remember before the Lord our departed family and friends who have gone before us in faith. We remember Buddy Aldrich. We remember Theron Edwards. We remember Russell Gross. We remember Lucy Harvey. We remember Dan Robbins. Let us pray. Almighty God, we remember with thanksgiving those who loved and served you in your church on earth and who now rest from their labors. Heal the brokenhearted and give us hope. Keep us in fellowship with all your saints and bring us at last to the joy of your heavenly kingdom through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you all. That was really beautiful. <laughs> hey, Joseph, can you and me spend some time together for just a second? Because I'm, I'm sort of pretending to be stone workman today. So you can, you can be all the squash blossoms and I'll be stone. So we can get together here. You know what this is, right? You know what that is? What is that? That's an offering plate. You're right. You're right. And, and you know what these things are? Oh, yeah, they're checks. That's right. You know what checks are about? The um, give invitations to up onto the web. Well, these checks actually are about money. Yeah. What, what people have done, and we won't, we won't read anybody's names here, but what people have done is they've written a check and they've said, okay, I'm going to give this much money to the church. And then the bank says, okay, you have that much money in your account, so we'll move from your bank account to the church's bank account, and so you'll have money. So a lot of people think that offerings are, are just about this stuff, you know, about money. Yeah. What do you think? Is that true, or is there more to it, do you think? There's more to it. I think there's more to it. I really do. Um, you know, when, when you get a check or cash, nobody, y'all don't do cash, do you? I noticed that. I'm kind of like, how am I going to put it? Anyhow. Um, <laughs> Money is a symbol. Money represents time. When I go to work and do things that I'm supposed to do, I get paid for the work that I do. So money that I get paid, that your dad gets paid, that your mom gets paid, all of us get paid, is a representation of our time. It's a symbol of what we do with the breaths and the heartbeats that God gives us to live. Make sense so far? Yep. Cool. So you know what else could go in this plate? Like a watch 
Could be a watch, yeah, because a watch has value. Could be a ring, because a ring has value. Could be your glasses. Mm -hmm. You know, I think your glasses probably are pretty valuable to you, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But you know what? Yeah, I can't see anything if I take my glasses off. That's why I have mine on today. You know, it's the most important thing that you can offer to God, because that's really what this is about, is, is that we're offering our time, our money to God. Do you know it's the most important thing that you could offer to God? All variations of time and like uh -huh. a clock or something? Variations of time. You're on the right track. You know, we, we can do this with you. I don't think I could do this with myself, but can I borrow your hand for a minute? You want to climb up here with me? There we go. See, what we could do is, and we won't actually make you do it, but we could put you in that offering plate. What do you think? Because we would be offering you, you would be offering you to God. Because one of the old time sayings that I learned a long time ago is that what you are is God's gift to you. And what you do with who you are is your gift to God. So you just helped me preach a major sermon to these folks. You feel okay about it? Yeah. Decent sermon? Okay. Let's pray together, shall we? You can join us. Dear God, Dear God, help us to offer ourselves to you in everything of our life. In Jesus' name we ask it. In Jesus name we ask you. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Joseph. I appreciate your help. I was impressed. I actually got it in my pocket without making horrendous microphone noises. Thank you. Um, clearly, this week, we want to make sure that we remember Ken and Kathy Sandwich as they are away and attending to uh, Kathy's father's death. Uh, what else, who else are we remembering in our prayers this week? Donald Hardwick. Yes, you know, and Joseph, he's at your school now. He's a custodian. His family has been custodians, and they lost their uh, auntie and uh, was the last person in the generation. They're very close, loving family. And um, Donald never asked me, could I ask you a big favor, and it's not for money. And I said, what is it, Donald? And he said, I know you're going to church. Would you all pray for my family? So we're going to pray for Don Hardwick's. Uh, family at the loss of their aunt. Yes, Sir Joseph. Miss Stacy James. Miss Stacy James, yeah. Yeah, her dad has COVID. You're right. Thank you. We will definitely pray for Stacy and her dad and her whole family because they have some tough choices to make. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. She's going to be there a while. Who else are we remembering this day, folks? Good. So for those of you who, who are watching virtually who can't hear Robin, just uh, let us know that is it fair to call that a reconciliation has taken place after two and a half years of estrangement from her daughter who, uh, after much prayer and much hoping on the part of many, many people, uh, this has come to pass by the grace of God. And that, that is... That's a worthwhile celebration truly is. Amen. Thank you. 
You know, I agree wholeheartedly. We should pray for educators and their students. I think that is exactly right. Thank you. Uh, life continues to be weird. Uh, and, you know, me, uh, I think we definitely need to be praying for the whole of our nation. Um, we have, I don't know, just kind of gotten crazy of late. And uh, I know that we are not crazy by nature, so... I pray that, that God in his grace and wisdom will, will draw us back from our own self-inflicted insanity uh, to a measure of, of humility and faith and, uh, and trust in our brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Lord, in this time that we share gathered together in worship in the name of your Son, who is our Lord and Savior, we lift up to you the Hardwick family and, and Robin's uh, reconciliation and Ken and Kathy and their whole family. And, and we are mindful that there are folks who we probably don't even know who join us virtually by worship and, and we know that you know them even when we don't. And so you would bless them please with everything it is needful at their point of deepest need. Bless us as well, that we might serve truly to be the blessing that you have called us to be. We thank you, Heavenly God, for the gifts that you have given this, this family of saints called the church, the gifts that you have given throughout the ages, those people that you have sent out into the world, those, those people who have shared good news, those, those people who have have taught Sunday school classes and taken care of little people and, and raised them to, to not just maturity of body, but also maturity of faith. We thank you that you have, have blessed us with the capacity to, to grow in faith and in understanding. We thank you for the blessing that you have given to us of, of creative imagination that has empowered us to, to sense new ways and to articulate new approaches to sharing your wonderful and unchanging old good news in Jesus Christ. We thank you as well, dear Lord, that you are continuing to work within each one of us individually to make us new day by day that as life progresses, we might grow more and more to resemble our brother Jesus and so that we might also become less and less attached to the ways of sin and evil. Lord, we give you thanks that you have given us good news, good news to live in and good news to share. And we ask that you might make us joyful and faithful and loving as we seek to glorify you by living in the light of your news. Lord, we offer this prayer and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. And as we do, we remember that he has taught us what it is to pray as we share together the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, the prayer of dedication that is indicated in the bulletin is an oversight on my part. Uh, if we were passing offering plates, we would be dedicating the offering. We're not doing that right now. But there is an offering plate over here, and it does have some checks in it. I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's just there. So, so thank you, all of you. Uh, one of the things I've told you before uh, that I, I love as an education of a preacher's kid, my dad's observation that, that while God is, is glad to accept gifts from a cheerful giver, the scripture says God loves a cheerful giver, uh, God also accepts gifts from grumpy givers as, as well. So, so feel free to grump, but sign the check. Just say it. So. 
I'm going to sit down now. Thank you. That's absolutely wonderful. You know what I really need? I really need a table over here for a cup of coffee and a trash can over here to throw away the pages as we go so I don't leave them. Just... You can tell I'm celebrating my 60th birthday, right? I'm getting kind of casual about the things that I say in worship. That's, that's not a good thing, trust me. Uh, our Old Testament reading today is from the 12th chapter. The first three verses. Listen as God speaks to us in his word. Now the Lord said to Abram, and this is pre-covenant, became Abraham after covenant is initiated. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. 
I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And our New Testament reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the the church in Ephesus, the first 12 verses of, of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we, who were the first to set our hope in Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. Friends, may God bless this, the reading and the hearing of his holy word. I I really wish all of y'all could have been at the the session meeting, our last session meeting. because after we had taken a look at the financials of of our family of faith, which, by the way, are remarkably sound given the strangeness of the times in which we have lived these past, what is it, seven or eight months now, I guess, um, we were taking note of the fact that we are entering into that time of, of the church's year, which has traditionally and historically through, oh, I don't know, at least the history of the American experience, come to be known as stewardship season. You really need to hear that. And, and bless Linda, I'm going to pick on you. Can I pick on you just a little bit? Linda said, well, John, it's time to preach the sermon. <laughs> so this is the sermon it is the stewardship sermon. Um, that, that's my radio announcer voice. Do you like that? There should be a drag race involved with that voice. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm, I'm kind of playing with y'all a little bit for a couple of reasons. Number one, I get a little anxious around this time of year. I think most pastors probably do. But also, uh, in, in different contexts, this sermon has had a very different tone. I, I have had the privilege of talking about stewardship from a theological perspective with congregations who said, you don't ever talk about money and expect to continue to be a pastor in this church. And they were serious, (laughs) very serious. Uh, I have also had the privilege of talking about what it means to be a steward of the gifts of God in congregations that were so ridiculously, embarrassingly affluent that uh, it was kind of like comparing, uh, you know, the the gifts of the wealthiest of the wealthy to the widow's might when we talked about stewardship. It was was a tough slog. But I just wanted to kind of dig into this a little bit because my guess is that most of us probably start to squirm a little bit when we figure out, okay, it is time for the sermon. You know, how is this going to go? 
Um, because, let's be honest, for most of us, if we've grown up in the church, some expression of it, I think most of us here probably have, don't know about you people watching, but probably a good bit of you, uh, stewardship has just become a code word. Uh, and it's a code word for, for fundraising. You know, that's, that's how we hear it most often, is, is it the time of year when you have to preach the sermon? Um, and I just want to make sure that we're clear that yes, we as a congregation do have bills and salaries to pay and, and programs to maintain and missions to support. All this is true, but this is just the smallest portion of the truth. And so today, for the time that we share together, I want to kind of dig into this, this word steward just a little bit. In, in the original language, the Greek of, of the New Testament, the word for steward is an interesting one. It's oikonomos, oikonomos. And if that might sound a little familiar to you, it's because it shows up in several other English words, words like, like ecumenical and economics and ecology. All of those sound pretty familiar, don't they? That's all coming from this same root in the Greek language, oikos. Oikos means house. Oikos is used throughout the New Testament to talk about the church community. A family, a family's house, an animal's place to live, and, and even the whole inhabited world. Economics, or oikonomia, shows up in, in the 16th chapter of, of Luke's Gospel in verses 2 through 4, and, and it talks about the plans or the rules that apply to the household. Ecumenical, or oikumene, my Greek is not as good as it used to be. Uh, my Hebrew was better, but it's terrible now. Anyhow, oikumene, which is ecumenical, uh, shows up again in, in Luke in the 21st chapter, and it has to do with everyone who lives within the household. And ecology deals with the knowledge, logos, the words about, the understanding of the household itself. So let's get back now to to oikonomos, which really translates to the keeper of the household, a steward. A keeper of the household is, is deeply involved in the working of the household with the awareness that, that he or she is, is overseeing and managing something that doesn't necessarily belong to him or to her key article of our faith as followers of the way of Jesus is we understand that the whole of creation is a household, an oikos, which belongs solely to God. The psalmist in Psalm 24 says it this way, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all those who live in it. So, all I'm trying to say at this point is that stewardship is really, really big. It is much bigger than church budgets. It's much bigger than congregations, much bigger than any one or, or even all of us together. Because stewardship is about how we handle and understand, how we make use of all that God has placed in our care. And while stewardship is a huge responsibility, what we just heard Paul tell the Ephesian Christians, it reminds us that our work is a little part of God's larger economy. God's plan for the household to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. So you learned this in your very first Sunday school class, I expect all of creation belongs to God, and that includes 
you and me. This means, and this is such a hard piece for our culture to swallow, I'm telling you, this means that we are merely managers rather than owners even of ourselves. When, when the great Saint John Calvin pondered this, this is what he wrote. He said, we are not our own masters, but belong to God. We are blessed and dedicated to God in order that we may think and speak and meditate and do nothing except to his glory. We are not our own. Let us therefore not set as our goal to seek what is expedient for us according to the flesh. We're gods. Let us live and die for God. We are gods. Let God's wisdom and will rule our actions. We are gods. Let all the part of our life accordingly strive toward God. We're the stewards rather than the owners of the time and the talents and the material resources that God has placed in our care in choosing us and in blessing us, in, in setting us aside in order to serve him, God then calls us to make use of all of creation, including the time and talents and tithes, you know, the work, worship, and wealth that God has entrusted to us so that we can be of useful service to him. We're caretakers, we're managers of the household of God and of everything that God has entrusted to us. Genesis reminds us of this. God has chosen us to be blessed in order that we might in turn be a blessing in his name. To be chosen by God is, is to find favor with God. Again, this has nothing to do with with how good we set out to be or, or how loving we want to be or, or how hard we work or anything that we might be able to do on our own merit. It's simply because God has the right, as God, the privilege to look favorably upon whomever it pleases God to do so. And the really incredible, amazing part for us is that we're included in that. God looks favorably upon us just because he chooses to through Jesus Christ. Just as God chose Abraham and just as Paul assures us that God has chosen us from before the foundation of the world, Abraham hadn't done anything especially wonderful or, or incredibly good or, or amazingly moral that would have somehow said, God, you know, I think I'm going to give that character a gold star. He just received as grace the gift of God because God chose to give it. Why would God choose such an unremarkable bunch of ordinary folks like us, do you suppose? Why would God set us apart? That's what it is to be a saint. It is to be sanctified, a sanctus, a set-aside one, set-aside one. Why would we be set aside? Well, God chose Abraham and Sarah to be the founding parents of a nation of chosen people, a blessing for those who blessed him, a cursing for those who cursed them, God chose us, according to Paul, to provide us with the redemption and the forgiveness, and in the process, to give us some way to begin to understand the purpose behind God's relationship with all of humanity. We get to be the bearers of the light. To be chosen and set apart and called by God which is what we are as followers of the way of Jesus, is to be of useful service to him. And that's why God 
has chosen us so that through us the world sees and hears and touches and tastes and knows something about Jesus Christ through each one of us and all of us together. We're blessed in order to be a blessing in Jesus' name in whatever corner of the world in which we find ourselves. Really and truly, if you kind of fade out for the rest of the sermon, you can do that. Here's what you need to take note of. Don't you like it when somebody does that? Say, pay attention to this, you can ignore the rest. The most important thing to take home is this. The wise use of time and talents and material resources that God has entrusted to us is how we as humans respond with thanksgiving to God's love and mercy and grace in light of the fact that through no gift of our own, God has chosen us in love to be the people of Jesus. And stewardship really is just the exercise of saying thank you to God for all that God has given to us. Stewardship then is not just about fundraising. It is a little bit about fundraising, but it is at least as much about worship, about compassion, about commitment, about belonging within the community of faith. Because stewardship is, is about understanding how our relationship with God and our neighbor and ourselves work and being rightly oriented in that relationship with our creator and with his creation and with all of his creatures, which is us. So in terms of the sermon, stewardship is, is a whole lot bigger than our budget. Giving has always been a, a mark of, of Christian discipleship and, and, and of commitment to our faith. The way in which we make use of, of God's gifts of material goods and, and our abilities, our time, really should reflect a sense of gratitude and a, and a sense of confidence that, that God is doing something with us that's way beyond anything that we can imagine that we're doing for ourselves. It's his household, not ours. We're in charge of making sure the floors stay clean, making sure the windows work, making sure the kitchen is ready. You know, as that's what we're here to do, is to respond to Christ's call to use those resources in ministry and, and to share those resources with others in the name of Jesus. By our stewardship, we are being witnesses of God's presence and power and work because we are, among other things, stewards of the good news. And so stewardship, once again, is far beyond uh, what the pledge card says. It's, it's really beyond your time and talent sheet. It is the realization that we have been entrusted with the news that God has given us of great love. And we are then called upon to make wise and faithful use of our skills and abilities in giving away that love. There's a whole lot more words on the page. I'm not going to read any more of these words. I simply want to say this. We are an amazingly, graciously, incredibly, lavishly blessed people. And we, in this corner of God's kingdom, right here, right now, this moment, have been given by God all of the resources we need today, this moment, to be the people that God calls us to be in serving Jesus Christ. 
Think about that a little bit. And ask yourself if you're grateful. And if you are, then let us express our gratitude for how profoundly blessed we are by, by using our stewardship of God's gifts to be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would y'all stand and we're going to share a, a responsive declaration of faith. We'll begin together in unison and then I'm going to ask y'all a question about midway. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified me, and kept me in the true faith in the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. fits pretty well, doesn't it? <laughs> you know what I'm going to tell you. It's the same thing that I'm always going to tell you, and it's probably the only sermon I have that's worth hearing. Love. Love the Lord our God with all of our strength, all of our soul, all of our heart, all of our mind, totally beyond our ability to do on our own. And yet, when we find this love empowered by the gift of faith in Jesus Christ, it becomes the foundation of, of love for our neighbor, the neighbor who is like us and not like us, the neighbor who is near to us and far from us, 
the neighbor who is easy to like and the neighbor who is almost impossible to like in the very same way that we ourselves find that we have first been loved by our Lord Jesus Christ. Go from this place then and live by this law because this is God's law. And as you go, may the grace and the mercy and the peace of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with each and every uniquely wonderful one of you and all of us wherever we may be throughout every day of this life and into life everlasting. Amen.